So, there are these four hippies from Canada, right? Scott Pilgrimage, Kim Pinetree, Stephen Stubble, and Young Neil. And these three right here are like, Scott, you can't date a 17 year old girl. That's like unethical and shit. And bro is like, yeah, but like, I wanna. Okay, fair enough. So this grown ass man takes this poor girl, Knives Chow, 17 years old, out to Goodwill. And she's like, you think your band could cover Row, Row, Row Your Boat next? It's the only song I know. And he's like, I I'm sorry, who are you? Turns out he's been getting visions of this other chick rolling around in his barren landscape of a brain. And through a series of incredibly roundabout methods, Scott the Waz convinces her to go out with him. Quick poll, ladies. If a random dude at a party chatted you up, went through a bunch of back channels to discover where you worked, and then admitted that he orchestrated an event where you would show up at his doorstep, would you go out with him? I'm just saying, I can buy that subspace highways and affordable housing are actually real, but this is the one thing where I can't quite suspend my disbelief. Anyway, that doesn't matter, because Ramona seduces him with her 10,000 flavors of Lipton, and now they got a whole friends with some canoodling thing going on. Naturally, Scott's roommate, the greatest and gayest character that ever lived, Wallace fucking Wells, calls out his punk ass, being like, dude, if you don't break up with your fake high school girlfriend right now, I'ma tell Chris Hansen all about you when I bring him over for dinner later. Scott, of course, is too pussy to heed his warning, and he has no qualms about inviting everyone he's ever fucking known his whole life show up when his band performs at the local Starbucks. Suddenly, this pirate guy smashes through the ceiling wanting to pick a fight because he dated Ramona when they were like two years old or something, and Scott's like, Welcome, punch! Give me a break, y'all. I'm old as shit. Ramona is totally wooed by his scrawny chivalry, but before they can actually be legit, Scott breaks it off with the 17 year old side piece he shamelessly cheated on and utterly shatters her fragile little heart. So. Yay? Thankfully, Scott offsets his douchiness by being somewhat decent at cooking and inviting flowers for dinner. And she's like, So, I read this cool thing on a GeoCities page that said bread makes you fat. Did you know that? Well, sure, but anything high in carbohydrates can make you fat, because it all gets converted into sugar. But as long as you regularly exercise and maintain your vitamin C levels, bread alone shouldn't make you any fatter than any other food. We're eating sourdough. Sourdough makes you fat? Meanwhile, Knives Chow, 17 years old, is descending into madness after her first idealization of a generic white boy ended in heartbreak. It's okay, hun. we You've all been there. She decides to pull the whole rebellious Asian girl look by streaking her hair, hooking up with young Neil, and then shanking Ramona during her date with Scott's sister. And she's like, the hell kind of last name is Flowers anyway? My dude, your first name is Knives. Like, hello? At the same time, Scott is scheduled to beat up Chris fucking Evans, the second evil ex, and all things considered, he's actually pretty chill about his enlisted villainy. That said, he ultimately kills himself after he realizes that somebody actually left him for Michael Sarah. Our homeboy Scott Falco tries to relax after a day of doing absolutely nothing, but then he gets called by a disembodied pair of lips who very sexily tells him to die. And I'm like, yo dude, Trey blazes with me, yeah? Anywho, turns out the lips are actually Scott's ex, big time pop star Brie fucking Larson, who invites the squad backstage to supposedly work out the logistics of getting his band to perform with her, but mostly just to fuck with their minds. And she uses her hot bitch powers to convince Kim that she's probably gay, that Knives Chow 17 years old is totally gay, and that Steven Stills is definitely not straight. Coincidentally, Scott's ex is dating Ramona's ex, Jason Todd, who demonstrates the previously thought to be impossible technique of making veganism look cool to an early 2000s audience. They take the fight over to a retailer called Honest Ed's, but end up wiping the franchise out of existence. And Ramona's like, yeah, the dude blew a chunk out of the moon for me, threw the tidal waves out of whack, and completely desecrated the planet's ecosystem in the most infamous show of bioterrorism ever recorded. Wow, is that why you broke up with him? What? No, he ate my tater tots one day without asking me. That cocky cock! On a related note, turns out Scott's ex is actually pretty innocent, despite being a heartless bitch, cause she's totally convinced that her elementary school relationship with Todd would last a lifetime, and that her stage name Envy is really cool and not at all cringe. Ramona tells her to piss off and proceeds to hammer her out. Scott comes back after apologizing to Knives for being a complete waste of human filth, and through a series of highly contrived but absolutely hysterical circumstances, Envy busts Todd's balls for cheating on her with a sex bot, the bros duke it out with a good old fashioned bass battle, and Vegan Boy gets his psychic powers removed on account of not being intolerable enough. And in every sense of the word, Scott gets a life. 
Sometime later, the Gen Xers are having a birthday blowout for Steven Sundere girlfriend, Julie Powers. And in a scene that encapsulates the continuously fickle morals of the Scott Pilgrim fandom, Kim Pine and Knives Chow, 17 years old, go fucking at it. Wait, you may be saying right now, this was not in the movie? And I'm like, yeah, this was content that was all cut from the original manga. You know, where all the good stuff is at. Anywho, one day Scott is like, yo, Ramona, how old are you again? I'm 16, man. Oh, damn. Well, you know, it's cool. I consider you very mature for your age. And hey, if the cops start asking around, just tell them that I'm like, you know, your cousin or something. I was joking, dude. I'm 24. Oh. Me too. Yeah, so Scott realizes that in order to minimize his creep levels, he's going to have to maximize his adulting proficiency. He starts off strong by getting a job at an avocado toast factory, using said income to move into Ramona's cat's place so he can stop being Wallace's sugar baby, and then he gives Knives' old man an apology that's better than the one he gave to the guy's own daughter. But between all that comes the blonde from across the lawn, Lisa Miller. So, a bit of lore here. Girl was compadres with Scott and Kim during their high school days before moving away to star in a Marvel movie. She comes back to escape the shame and becomes the sweetest, nicest homewrecker ever for Scott and Ramona's relationship. Thankfully, Scott grows one half of his balls to tell her he's spoken for. Dude then runs into his girlfriend chatting up this ninja at work and he's like, Yo, Rams, why are you talking with this girl whose boob I touched one time? I didn't give you permission to do that. And she's like, chill, Holmes. This is my old girlfriend that rocks my socks off. And I was just telling her that it's over. I don't have feelings for her anymore. And that there's no chance of us ever getting, hey, you want to sleep together? Yeah, sure. Back together. Scott soon realizes just how goddamn lucky he is to have a girlfriend who knows the touch of a woman. And realizes right then and there that he's a bona for the Ramona for life. And sends Roxy packing with the newfound power of lesbians. Oh yeah, speaking of Kim, girl gets tired of her bitchy roommate leaving their gitch around, so she dumps them for an even bitchier roommate named Joseph Stalin. Dude's got a home studio that's 10 times better than the one I have for YouTube, and Steven Studd lets him suck him off so that he'll record their mediocre band. As it turns out, this is just a precursor to the two harshest realities that every young adult must eventually face in their life. The realization that all of your friends are growing the fuck up and moving on and that you'll have to achieve some level of emotional maturity in order to keep up with them. And that anything you think you're good at, there are two Japanese engineers who can do it a lot better. Scott's gotta do both of them at once. In the meantime, Blue Hair and Pronouns is getting so damn tired of putting on the manic pixie girl at cause like, she doesn't want folks to realize that she's just a regular person with regular problems and regular fears of the unknown. It gets so bad that her hair starts graying in a color that's so bright it's actually reflective, and her Amazon salary can no longer cover the funds to dye it every week. Knife spills the beans about how Scott might have groomed her if he wasn't too much of a dumbass to be manipulative, and Ramona uses this as the perfect excuse to be like, Sorry bro, but if I stick around too long, the Twitter mob will be up my ass for enabling your bullshit. You understand, right? No, I don't understand. What the hell's a Twitter? Is that like the new Club Penguin or something? Pilgrim smashes those Japanese dudes who are members 5 and 6 of the X-Men and runs back to tell Ramona how he loves her for the person behind the romanticized version of her or some other such nonsense. But it's too little, too late. Ramona has dipped. To make matters worse, Scotty Boy is homeless now because Bro lost his keys to the apartment and landlords with empathy haven't been invented yet. Dew starts couch surfing only to realize that his buddies are too busy with life in general now to be of any fun. Steve's got a new band now, Kimmy's moving in with her folks, and young Neil became that one annoying dude that makes weed his entire personality. You know the one. Luckily, Scott and his fucking nepotism gets an apartment paid for by his parents because his very existence serves to piss me off. And upon seeing his old buddy fall into quote unquote disarray, the Wallace Raptor is like, try getting laid dude. Last I checked, you heteros were obsessed with that kind of thing. And Scott's like, aren't you humping your mobile phone like eight times a day? Hey, I didn't make the gay rule book, man. I just wrote it. Regardless, Scott runs the idea over with Knives Chow, 18 years old, but the thrill of being legally creepy just isn't the same as the thrill of being illegally creepy. He tries again with Envious Adams, but she's vaguely, sort of, maybe, not interested. Probably. He finally goes to see Kimberly out in the boonies, where they almost get something going again, but then she's like, nah, fuck that noise, before Negascott shows up to clean house. 
Scott Prime swallows him up in order to gain clarity on the conduct he exhibited during his past romantic affiliations, and our hero learns something that we as viewers were already privy of since the very first panel of Volume 1. Oh my god. I fucking suck. So, my dude drags his enlarged balls over to this sick-ass nightclub operated by Envy's manager, professional cunt, and Ramona's seventh and final evil ex, Gideon Gordon Glass's gaslight gatekeep girl boss Graves. Almost everyone we've ever met so far is there to see Envy's show, and maybe witness Scott's death while they're at it. Including characters I've yet to draw, like Wallace's buddy, the other Scott, recurring randos, Sandra and Monique, Scott's Emoto, Stacy Pilgrim, and Knives' only friend ever, Tamara Chen. Anyway, the show starts and Gideon and Scott waste no time arguing over who's the marginally better man. The marginally worse man reveals that the whole League of Evil X thing was just his buddies going on a tilting spiral after Ramona kept smoking their butts at Mario Kart. And Scott's like, what you talking about? Ramona only plays Fantasy Star Online too. And Gideon's like, oh Scotty, you really don't know her. Do ya? So, bro ends up in a limbo where his American dream girl is at, and she's like, Look man, I'm sorry I ghosted you, okay? I just figured you wouldn't like me anymore if you found out what I really am. A teenage girl? What? No! That I'm not a socially conscious hipster chick with some cool mysterious past. I'm just a basic ass white girl from Vermont who wears Uggs and drinks pumpkin spice lattes while unironically watching Family Guy. What's wrong with watching Family Guy? It's a funny show. It's problematic, Scott! You can't enjoy media where the main character is a terrible person who makes questionable decisions. That means you agree with him! Hey, if knowing a person is shitty means that you have to give up on them, then I wouldn't be here right now literally dying for you. What are you saying? I'm saying that I know you've done questionable things and that you've conducted yourself in ways I don't personally agree with. And the truth is, I can deal with that. Being in a relationship with someone doesn't mean you suddenly advocate for everything they do. It just means that you care about them enough to want to see them get better. So, dude responds and Girlie uses her angry woman powers to drive 20 miles back to Toronto just so she can punch Gideon in the face. This awards her with her own sort of lesbianism, but not before the gets their shish kebabs her, leaving Scott to enter the deep recesses of Ramona's subconscious in order to save her. And oh, okay. Now I know why they call this place subspace, you know? <laughs> Cause it's a, yeah. Anyway, Ramona's 15 Tinder accounts mass report on Gideon for violating the terms of safe, sane, and consensual. But dude tries to pull a gotcha moment being all, I did nothing wrong. Those whores wanted me to sodomize them in their sleep. It's all part of the game. And then Scott in his ever evolving wisdom is like, dude, you're just like me for real. So the day is saved and life as we know it continues to move on. Scott and Kim start a ban on this new thing called SoundCloud. Steve and Joe beat themselves off. Knives Chow, 18 years old, is still the very best like no one ever was. And Neil and Stacy have a last minute hookup because it's my video and I fucking said so. And at the end of the day, Ramona is like, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to start taking accountability for my actions, Scott. I mean, what if several years down the line, people who barely know us decide to dig up every ignorant thing we've ever said in order to discredit us? Come on, Ramona, it's 2010. I think it's safe to assume that no one could ever have enough free time to do something so petty and vindictive. And hey, even if they do, that shouldn't stop us from trying. You know, for all the weird nonsensical fantasy bullshit that happens in this series, I think the most skeptical part of it for me was the fact that Ramona can somehow afford a swanky ass duplex apartment on an Amazon delivery salary. Granted, this was in like circa 2003 Ontario, and my knowledge of housing and salary rates over there at the time are largely non-existent. If you have an answer to this question that no one else is asking, then please feel free to sign up for my Patreon and leave your answer in my Discord server. It only costs three bucks a month and your name will be forever immortalized with the rest of these sexy bitches. And as always, thanks for watching, smash up that subscribe button, and until then, stay tuned.